Morning, Glory America. It's Hugh Hewitt. It is an unusual Hillsdale dialogue this week. I use an unusual opening because Dr. Larry Arn and I uh, meet in a time of crisis to talk about leadership in crisis based upon Dr. Arn's deep, thorough knowledge of the two great leaders of the last two centuries, Winston Churchill and Abraham Lincoln, in what I hope is a useful guide to everyone who is leading in any capacity right now. Good morning, Dr. Arn. How are you? Good, Hugh. How are you doing? I am good. Uh, you know that uh, I played vow to thee my country for a particular reason, which is these are unusual times. I don't know that we've ever talked uh, on the air during a time like this. Yeah. We weren't going in 9-11, and it, this is a little bit like that. Uh, yeah, it's, that's my wife's favorite hymn, by the way. I, I wish I could say I knew that, but I didn't. I'm glad. It, it, it's moving, right? It's oh, moving it's because it calls upon people to sacrifice for the love of country. And then, you know, the, the, the tune is uh, from the Jupiter movement of the Holtz, of uh, Gustav Holtz, the planets. And it just breaks out to that. The movement breaks out of that in the middle. You, you should, people should listen to that. It's just very moving when that, when, when that tune starts in the middle of the movement of the symphony. Of course, I knew that. Yeah, of course. You did. <laughs> <laughs> I, I work in a college, too. I'm very cultured. <laughs> All right. Look, uh, I want to get to this, and, and we're going to uh, tape direct. We're doing what we call in radio a dead roll so that I do not interrupt Dr. Arn for commercial break. And then I'll break it up over the course of two hours in the course of the week. Uh, it's a crucial week. Uh, Earlier today, I talked with Dr. Larry Hogan, I mean Governor Larry Hogan, and he told me that he thought President Trump was rising to the challenge. That is the question that is in front of everyone. Are they rising to the challenge? Let's begin with the president and then move through. Do you think he is, Dr. Arn? What is the challenge and what does it mean to rise to the challenge? Well, uh, you know, so we don't. <laughs> the, 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 the question of the first, the answer to the first question is, I don't know. Uh, here, and here's what I mean by that. It's possible that this thing is devastating and might kill two million, two, two million Americans, and it's possible that it might be really bad flu. Uh, and I get authoritative sources writing each of those two things in alternation all day long. So I think it's the right thing to have a short lockdown, but I also think it can't be sustained. And, and that's just simple arithmetic, if you think about it for a minute. Uh, how, many, how many people can go two months without income without serious impairment of their situation? So, and, and that means the country can't do that either. Um, so, you know, this is very bad, and, uh, and that means that the cure is certainly very painful, and that means it should not be prolonged a minute longer than it has to be. Now, uh, President Trump to turn to him, and, and my, my point about this is going to be two things. One is you have to meet the emergency. We're going to talk about wars, terrible emergencies, but you have to remember why you're fighting, and that is to preserve peace, and peace and freedom mean the latitude of people to act however they want to, you know, as long as they don't hurt somebody else. And so Lincoln and Churchill were ruthless and incredibly effective wartime leaders, and they didn't forget that point. And I have examples of that that I'll mention today. And so, so far, President Trump, I, I like it that he is aggressive about this thing, and I like it that he is impatient about this thing, <laughs> both. And, uh, and that gives me hope and comfort that this won't go on any longer than it needs to go on. And, uh, I've always know. said to people that the objective of the Hillsdale Dialogues and of this radio show is to remind people of what Thucydides wrote, the secret <laughs> to happiness is freedom, and the secret to freedom is courage. Mm -hmm. And that that's consistent from the Greeks through Jerusalem all the way through the British Empire to the American Revolution to the founding of the rule of law to the Constitution. It's all about freedom. Mm -hmm. And... We, we're, we're entering a period of time where freedom is going to be curtailed, as it was in the Civil War and World War II. So I asked Dr. Under prepare to talk about Lincoln in crisis and Churchill in crisis. So let's begin with Lincoln and remind people 
This is not the worst time America has ever seen, even if we get to 1918 to 1920 pandemic levels. It will not be the worst. Yeah, that's correct. Very correct. Uh, if, uh, you know, on a smaller population, the body count on the battlefield was 700,000 in, in the Civil War, much smaller <laughs> nation. And, of course, civilian casualties were also very large. So it's not like that. And, uh, and it, it is unlikely to be like that, in my opinion. But it's good to take precautions so it doesn't get like that. So let's begin by talking about the attitude that Lincoln adopted as he governed. His picture, and I sat next to George W. Bush once in the, in the Oval. He had a half dozen talk show hosts. And he pointed to the picture of Lincoln. And he said, 41 is in my heart, but that man is in my head. <laughs> what did he mean by that? He was in war at that point. It was the surge. What did he yeah. mean by that? Well, you know, Lincoln, you know, was, the, you know, like, sort of like, for different reasons, like Churchill was the last guy in the world to divide the country and summon the whole strength of the country, north and south, pitted against each other. And that was a terrible trial to him, and it, you know, it wrecked him. And uh, he might have been, if he hadn't been shot, what, six days after the Southern surrender at Appomattox, he might have had a few good years, <laughs> which he really didn't get, you know. And uh, and so it was a terrible thing. But but Lincoln was extremely effective because he, look, if you if you just picture the situation, uh, when when Lincoln is inaugurated president, first of all, he's never run a big thing in his life. He has a little bit of of war experience in a in a fight with the Black Hawk Indians, uh, and the capital is pretty much surrounded by secession talk, Virginia and Maryland, and and uh, the Southerners have seceded, besieged a federal fort, and and you know they have ambassadors. He talks about this in the first inaugural, waiting to talk to him to you know, settle between two separate nations. And he didn't have an army, and he didn't really have a way to get one. He, all he could do is call for troops, and he didn't know if any would come. And, you know, he called for 75,000, which seemed an astronomical number, but by the end of the war, that seemed like a tiny number. Uh, we didn't really have a military establishment. It's sort of like in the Revolutionary War. There weren't a lot of people around who knew how to fight a big war. I mean, we'd had the Mexican War, and North and South, the leading generals, had fought beside each other against the Mexicans in that war. But that was the experience that we had, and not as big as this is going to turn out to be. He offered the command of the Union of, of the Washington, D.C. forces, there were not overall Union forces at that time, to Robert E. Lee, who thought about it a couple of days and thought about taking it, and uh, and then didn't, and so he became the great commander of the other side, a very consequential fact in the war. And so the war went badly. You know, how would he, you know, the early battles were terrible. And uh, Lincoln, you know, I, I read this morning, thinking about this, what did he do after the battle, the first battle of Manassas or Bull Run, where, you know, it's fought in the, in the environs of Washington, D.C., and some people had gone out to have a picnic in a high place from D.C. and watched the battle. And the northern troops were routed, and most of them ran all the way back to Washington. And so that just looks disastrous. And that's, that, that's the theme of Lincoln in the war. He uh, doubled down every time. He wrote, a, he wrote a letter after Manassas of things that need to be happening right now. And he sent it to the old man, General Winfield Scott, a Mexican war veteran. And, uh, and you know, he soon replaced him, too, with somebody more vigorous, but who didn't work out, McClellan. Oh, that's another thing. The generals didn't work out for a long time. Uh, uh, then he found Grant, and that changed things. But at that time, Grant, uh, the really great uh, author, Bruce Catton, if you want to read a history of the Civil War, it's an older one, but it's, called it the uh, bicentennial no the centennial history of the civil war by Bruce Catton who was an Ohio journalist and you know back in those days the journalists from Ohio used to be intelligent 
<laughs> oh, I saw that. I blocked that jab. I was ready. For that. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. It, uh, uh, it's really great. And and uh, he he describes how Lincoln acted. And uh, he says after the Battle of Antietam, the first there were only two battles fought on northern so- soil. The first one to a draw, the second one the South was defeated, and Antietam is in Maryland, outside Washington, D.C., and uh, and the commanders, they fought, and it was the, it is actually the greatest number of casualties in a day in American history. About 25,000 people died, more than any single day at Gettysburg. And, uh, uh, and uh, so then the Southern Army goes back down, and it's been bloodied, and, of course, it wasn't as able to replace its losses as the North was. And, uh, and, and, and uh, Lincoln called for more troops, and Canton writes, and this is a paraphrase, but it's close. So the war expanded to a place that no one had foreseen, but also it narrowed down to two people, Lincoln and Lee, who had the awful ability to make men love them and the ruthlessness to tell them what to do. <laughs> so ruthlessness is a part of this. I, I want to pause for a moment on Antietam. It, it raises a key distinction between then and now. I've walked from the Dunker Church down to Burnside's Bridge along the Bloody Lane. I know the battlefield. We don't have a visible enemy. We, we don't have anyone to defeat. We're fighting a virus, although that virus has been unleashed on the world because of the Communist Party of China, and we should not forget that. Uh, we will return to that when it's done. How does that make this unique among uh, as the president likes to say, he's in a war, the country's in a war, but we really, it's not one we've waged before. No. And um, I'm going to say something about declaring war in, against domestic evils. Uh, this is not really a domestic evil, it's kind of mixed. But uh, in a minute, because Churchill was eloquent on that subject. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, in a way, we, we do all very much have to pull together and take care of each other. But against what? And the, you know, I will tell you the worst thing about this to me. Uh, I, I have told every influential person I know this. Uh, the strength of our country, as opposed to say China, you know, one prays we will never be as good at clamping down as China is. Uh, but uh, our strength is how many. Americans are there available to help? And the answer is, in principle, every citizen. Every citizen is an owner of the country. And the great crises in America, we have passed them by citizen armies and citizen efforts. And so we're, you know, mostly regarded by the government right now as carriers of a disease and confined to quarters. And, I, and I, I'm not saying that I wouldn't do that myself, uh, but... I am saying that we should be looking urgently for a way to break out of that. We should get people to help. Uh, now, I, w- I want to uh, tell you, uh, Dr. Larry Arn, our friend Senator Cotton yeah. had posted as we spoke uh, a very moving tweet from John Stone. This priest, suffering from the coronavirus, gave up his ventilator to give it to a younger patient and has died. His name was Don Giuseppe Barrett. Berardelli, he was 72 years old, from Bergamo. So it's an Italian priest. Senator Cotton writes, May God rest his soul. Our nation is taking precautions to minimize wrenching life and death decisions like Father Berardelli's tomorrow. There is a lot of suffering right now. How did Lincoln endure that suffering? Uh, Well, you know, he lost one of his children, uh, his favorite, little Todd, right after the war started. So personal grief struck him right away. And, uh, yeah, he, like Churchill, hated that part of it worse than any. Like George W. Bush, by the way, who has a really great record of visiting with the people who lose, who lost people in the Gulf War, uh, visiting families who lost people in the Gulf War. So that was, you know, and it wore on him something awful. And so, and you, but you very much need that. Right. I mean, you know, the casualties didn't bother Hitler when they when they ran out of gas and they were surrounded. Hitler's one of Hitler's last statements was the German people have proved unworthy of me. Well, that's tyranny. Right. Whereas 
Lincoln, one of the reasons it was so restless for him and for Churchill was that they spent so much energy trying to find a way to truncate it and spare lives. And uh, that's, you know, that, that, that places you in a different kind of condition of stress of soul than Hitler ever knew. And, uh, and that's, you know, although Hitler did the decent thing right at the end and shot himself, too bad he shot his wife first. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's the thing, right? And if we start getting a big body count in America, you know, that'll be terrible. And, you know, we should say a word about Senator Cotton because he, he started worried, warning about this, if I recollect, in January. He was uh, early and, to the bell. That's what and, I call uh, it, early to the bell. Yeah, that's right. And he and I, I think what it told him, I'll opine for him now, although he hasn't said exactly this to me. I think what it told him was, you know, he doesn't really trust China. <laughs> and they covered all this up, and then they took these draconian measures. And that's what told him this must be serious. And uh, it is serious. And and uh, And he's one of the people I've said, you know, like uh, – I think there's going to be, you know, first of all, after this is over, and pray it will end soon, after it's over, there's going to be lots of talk that this proves that the government ought to own everything, because look how it steered us through this if it goes well. But I think that we mustn't forget something, and that is we don't have testing kits in America. I mean, only now are we getting them. Now, why is that? Uh, we have an enormous bureaucracy. To, to, to look after things like this. And why, you know, what, uh, what apparently is happening in South Korea, most successful place, I think, along with Japan and Taiwan, is that they're, they're just testing everybody who shows symptoms, and they're isolating them. And they're putting on social media uh, where the spots are, where people are getting this thing, and to other people encouraged to stay away. But meanwhile, there and you know, I, I saw a picture of some uh, workers in white suits. Apparently, they scrub down the subway cars in Seoul twice a day. Uh, and so the point is, they they have been able pretty much to go about their lives. And when I say you know, if you call for volunteers, you've got to be ready to do that. You know, I've the students are not here at Hillsdale College, and they're not here because it was spring break. I even kind of regret that. And they all write me, you know, we want to come back, right? And I said, look, if you come back, there's a bunch of them who were here who didn't go home for spring break, and I had a long talk with about 50 of them before it was illegal to or discouraged to have more than 10. And, uh, and I said, you know, look, if, you, if, if I bring all the students back, you may be carrying bedpans for each other and getting sick yourself. And they all said, that's what we should do, <laughs> you know. It's a very uh, collegial kind of college here. Well, if we were organized to, to put people to work, that would be a different spirit in the government than the spirit we're going to take care of it all. When uh, Abraham Lincoln came into office, there were 30,000 postal workers, and there were about 5,400 other federal civilian employees. And the number of other federal civilian employees ballooned to 15,500 by the end of the war. <laughs> they started an agriculture department. They started a bureau of pensions. And, you know, there was some stuff like that. Well, they had um, to build the railroad and they had to settle the Homestead Act, right? That took well, at least you know, a dozen the big, people. The big legislation from Lincoln, well, there's a, a national banking system. They founded that. And they did the Homestead Act, and they did the Morrell Act. And the Morrell Act is the second in American history great federal gift to education, and it was like the first. What the first did was reserve a township in each, you know, the federal government owned the Northwest Territory where you and I are from, you from the dumb part of it. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, uh, they, they gave it to the states reserving one section in each township to benefit education in that township. So that was a huge federal subsidy without the creation of any administrative apparatus in Washington. Well, the Morrell Act did the same thing for colleges, and Lincoln signed that act, and uh, that, that's where the land-grant colleges come from. 
So in and oh, he uh, signed an order protecting uh, uh, Yosemite Valley as the first national became the first national park, and uh, it was sort of discovered during the war and uh, made news back in the east. So it, it was a different day back then because you know there are two million federal employees now, and there are twenty two million I think or nineteen million state and local employees, and they are substantially integrated into a single system. And that changes things, right? When In uh, 1863, a few days after the Battle of Gettysburg, there were draft riots in, uh, in New York City, and there were a couple hundred people killed, and they went on for two or three days. And they went on that long because it took two days to get any federal troops there. Because there wasn't, you know, Lincoln didn't have the power to enforce the law in detail on the people of America, and uh, uh, and and you know, I'm it's a it's good that we have that power today, but we also have to remember that that's dangerous, um, and you know, uh, Tocqueville's salute of America is that. Uh, um, it's uh, government here is more than in France, but it is local and voluntary in its character. And you know, it, it, as I say, this, I think the Centers for Disease Control is a blessing to the world, and they're very sophisticated. And God help us if they, God hope that they help us find a cure for this thing, and then a vaccine uh, in short order, which they're working on. And I guess there's some promise about that. But on the other hand. Why weren't there, you know, why didn't we take the steps that Japan and South Korea uh, and Taiwan took to get ready for a thing like this? And Dr. Fauci told me, when this is over. Dr. Fauci told me it's nobody's fault. I believe he is uh, guarding his institution against um, a withering critique of the testing fiasco. But there must be answers in order to prevent future pandemics. It was not President Trump's fault, nor more, no more than the lack of troops was Abraham Lincoln's fault, right? There was a James Buchanan, and he left Lincoln with a mess. What I want you to answer, uh, Dr. Ron, in the last 10 minutes we devote to Lincoln before turning to Churchill, is how did he lead? And, and this is for every local mayor, council member, county supervisor, board of health, Board of Education Superintendent, CEO. It's not just for the Trump cabinet. It's for everybody. What did Lincoln do? Uh, well, um, the best way to, you know, so what he, what he did, by the way, was ran the government in the war, and that means that almost all of what he did was talking to war leaders, generals, and cabinet members and people in Congress. That's what he, how he passed his time. And we know a lot about that, and we know that, when he went went uh, east to Washington from Illinois out on the frontier, we know that Seward and Chase, for example, big wheels from the east and in, in no, Seward's from Ohio, kind of the east, I guess. Anyway, big wheels, they sort of carved up the administration. They couldn't believe Lincoln asked them to be in it, and they thought we can just do whatever we want. Well, no, Lincoln turned out to be very formidable, and uh, Seward became very devoted to Lincoln. And so, first of all, he just did a good job with all those people and, and gave them direction, and they became loyal to him, and they worked together. And one of the reasons they became loyal was that he listened to them. And, you know, they reasoned together. That's Have you noted, job. by the way, the easy familiarity between doctors and president? Have you noticed that the scientists get along well with him, despite what the, the – endless heckling and snarky comments from the media and Twitter are they obviously enjoy his company yeah yeah and and you know he's apparently I don't know him but he's apparently a regular guy in some very very good ways I mean I you know I'll just my own experience at the colleges I just got a bunch of colleagues that I've worked with together for a long time and we've been figuring this out day by day and we all get heard and then there's a mechanism to decide and that mechanism turns out to be me. But I watch their faces while we talk. 
and a lot of my decisions are governed by what they say, and uh, almost all have, all are heavily influenced. So one thing to know is if the if if leaders get the object in mind. So my object is to have college. I'm hired to hold college. And so I want to get back to that the instant I can. And on the other hand, I can't be killing off the kids or the townspeople or the staff of the college. And so I'm not going to do that till it's safe. And so I just make both those points. And then we reason. Almost all of our reasoning is when is it safe? And we've got some metrics that we watch every day trying to sort through. And, you know, I've got a bunch of scientists working for me. You know, uh, a Hillsdale graduate football player is a leading virologist in the land from the University of Michigan, Ph.D., and he teaches in our biology department, and he's just a fountain of information about this stuff. But we're, try- we're watching to see, you know, when it's safe and legal to bring them back, and we're going to bring them back that minute. And- that, by the way, that is a great word to everyone. Uh, have your objective in mind. Consult widely. Speak to experts, try and do it in person so you can see them, yeah. and take decisions accordingly. If you, you know, and if you, you know, in healthy things uh, are good at, you know, because, you know, I don't know everything, and, and if you do a job like mine, or you, you find out you don't, you know, because you don't, and you don't know what to do half the time. Well, you've got to figure out what to do with a bunch of people. And and Lincoln was good at that, and Churchill was masterful at that. I mean, I know that story in greater detail. And and so one thing to, to – and remember, this, this you know, what I would say, my rules for, for proceeding at college are like the ones I suggest, and that is I want to get the students back as quickly as possible and get them helping. I want to do the safe thing for sure. And so not until it's safe. But then, you know, it's just good for everybody to have a part and not be passive. And then the people who work for you, you leaders of cities and states and stuff, you know, I'm, I don't have any particular wisdom about this. I've just studied people who have. Just remember, people love to be involved. They love to contribute. Give them a chance to do that, and almost all of them will sacrifice to do that. You know, so I've discussed with some of open. our friends the the need to have a beat the bug bond drive. I've written it in the Washington Post. Well, I, I, I think the the war bonds of World War One and Two were so so necessary to involving people who otherwise could not help. What what do you make of that idea? Well, that's it. See, that's um, um, uh, that's yeah. It, it, people want to help. And they don't want to be passive. And, of course, they don't want to be confined to their quarters while their livelihoods disappear. And, uh, you know, that, uh, as I say, I don't see how this can go on for a long time. My last question about Lincoln, Dr. Arn, is about candor. How did he speak to the country about the situation of the union? Did he sometimes hide the peril? Did he sometimes disclose too little or too much? How do you assess what a leader ought to do at the local level when uh, this could get very bad in two to four weeks? Very bad indeed. Well, here's the sublime uh, from those guys and very much in common. They were generous and clear in explaining. Indeed, their examples in many, in, in many of their speeches, Churchill gave many more than Lincoln gave, but uh, there are examples in speeches where they explain what they can't explain. And, you know, Churchill, you know, like uh, June 19th, fight on the beaches, 1940, right? By now, everybody knows France is gone, and the British Army has mostly returned without its weapons. And so he gives the first speech where the news is definitely bad, and he doesn't gloss that over, you know. And then he says, and then there's, an, uh, there's a, you know, there, there, there has to be an appraisal, and then there has to be a plan. And you need to have a plan that you can say out loud, because then everybody can participate with you in that plan. Everybody knows, okay, now we're going to do this, and then everybody can help. And the war effort, you know, America was very divided in the Civil War, of course, uh, grotesquely divided. Uh, and it, it wasn't so much 
you know, a complete movement of a people as World War II was in the United States or in Britain even more so. Because Churchill was really good at getting everybody involved, and Lord, they milked that country for the last resource. And Churchill was the one who hated to do that more than anybody. But the, one of the reasons he got that, you know, as far as we know about his popularity in that war full of disasters, we know less about Lincoln's. Uh, oh, we, know, we know he won the 1864 election. Uh, we, uh, Churchill never fell below 80%. And that's with disaster and terrible things happening all the time because he would go on the radio and explain everything to them. And then now this let, is let, what we're going to do. And then everybody could get up in the morning and know, know what we're going to do, and they could help. Now, now let us turn to Churchill because I believe the situation is more similar to a 20th century crisis than a 19th century crisis, if only in our ability to communicate and even more in an exponentially faster means. And with a media that is um, blessedly, I emphasize, blessedly free and social media, which is monstrously strong and blessedly free in this country. I would not have it any other way, but it's a difficult challenge. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, what yeah. Do- and, you know, in, in, uh, See, in World War II in America and in Britain, we had food rationing, right? I mean, that's, you know, this is not as bad as that. And it could, you're right, it could get that bad, and we have to brace ourselves. And uh, right now, before it gets really bad, and I hope that it won't get really bad, I'm making the point that we have to be prepared to get back to peacetime and not have the government run everything in the country. That's a point that Churchill made even during the key crises. But still, he was, you know, there was everything was allocated. There was a manpower committee. Churchill placed placed a great man. His name was Ernest Bevan. And uh, Churchill had great faith in him. Churchill got him into politics. He was a labor union leader. And he was meaner in hell. And he was a right, he was a big-time socialist, but he was a powerful anti-communist. And Churchill liked him and brought him into politics. And by the time, uh, after about a month, he was placed in charge of all war production. And that gave him the power to say who worked where. And and he did say that. And it's actually true that Ernest Bevan uh, and his actions helped prepare the way for the socialist victory in 1945. May I, may I tell you as well that I, one thing I've been arguing in my Washington Post columns, I've written three about congressional law, is that they have to adopt very, very loose special government employee rules so that the president can go and get whomever he needs. And I have in mind what you have taught me about Lord Beaverbrook. Churchill needed airplanes, and he went and got a press baron to produce airplanes. What does that teach us? Mm, yeah, Beaverbrook was crazy and a uh, very close friend of Churchill's, which you kind of needed to be to be that for a long time. And uh, <laughs> he, Churchill, you know, and Churchill just knew what kind of guy he was, right? And he didn't know anything about making airplanes. He just knew about getting stuff done. And so what he did was he lived on airplanes much of the for, or early months of the war. And every air, airplane manufacturing place has an airfield beside it. And so he would land his airplane, and he would walk in the factory, and he would say, which planes can you finish today? Everybody get to work on those. And then he'd leave. And so every day there was a stream of planes coming down. And they might have not been. And, you know, it mattered by the day and by the minute when they got there. So you need – you need, uh, and re- remember, we have that, that idea about loose rules – we have, in some substantial ways, compromised the executive authority. Uh, that means the president can't. Large parts of the federal administration are not really accountable to him, and that violates the principle of the university uh, unity of the executive, which is not a theory in the founding; it's a fact, and the and the reasons for it are proclaimed. Nonetheless, this is still America, and if you look at those doctors that you notice cooperating with the president. I would like to think they would cooperate if the president were a Democrat. Of too. course. And, and then we, you know, in the middle, and if this thing gets bad, we will, I, I predict and I believe, we Americans, 
we'll pull pull together and make a thing of this and and uh and we'll be better at it than anybody else uh now about why. churchill there is also so number one go get the best people and the congress must make it possible that the best people need not sell off their life work in order to serve right now you have to i i served in the white house counsel's office and i remember looking at an oil executive asking me are you out of your mind i have to divest all of my my wealth and the answer was yes we got to waive all that we have to get the best people quickly into jobs like ventilator production but I want to talk, and you're an expert on how Churchill communicated. I once read something, I can't remember, you'll probably know, that he was uh, referred to as a massive artillery gun, best in a fixed position, firing volleys that would devastate, and not as good in a Q&A with the press. Now, I think President Trump is exactly the opposite. I, I would love to see him uh, with the press jabbing and, and weaving and having fun and leaning against his desk rather than in a set piece speech at which he is not proficient. Well, that's a beautiful comparison. It just isn't true as regards. <laughs> <laughs> what you're quoting from but is. But doggone it, I read it somewhere. Well, Arthur Balfour, a great man whom Churchill loved. Churchill is a young MP. Uh, Arthur Balfour is a conservative prime minister. And Churchill is yapping at his heels. Soon, by the way, left the Conservative Party and broke Balfour's administration. They became close friends after that. But Balfour, who was very witty, he said, uh, he has a heavy but not a mobile artillery. That's, That's it. Said. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I mean, you just should read. Uh, I mean, just read Prime Minister's Question Time. Uh, I mean, they're, they're published in the official biography, and you can get an e-book of them. And, you know, I've, I've edited them, all the ones during the war, and, and uh, they're just hilarious. And, uh, well, and I'm sticking he, with Balfour, <laughs> yeah, to my yeah, point. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I stick with him, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I agree. Trump's rallies, uh, Trump is, you know, a responsive politician. He, he's, uh, the people who like him, one of the reasons they like him, and I think that's, half the people now, maybe more. One of the reasons they like him is he hears what people say, and he's responsive and quick coming back. And I heard a story. I didn't see it myself. Did you see it? Something about him asking the doctors at a press conference when the White House press corps, who seemed to be so angry, would get to sit in each other's laps again. <laughs> <laughs> I did not see it. but I, Somebody told I me. Wanna... I don't know. And see, I don't know if he did that or not, but... It's easy to believe that he did. <laughs> it is easy. And, and I want people to, to dwell on what you just said. I've made this point again and again. Rallies are feedback loops for the president. Yeah. When, a, when a line works at them, he internalizes it as a political goal. Sometimes that is bad. Mostly it is good, but it is real. It's a feedback loop. D Dinesh D'Souza wrote a, a good, short biography of Ronald Reagan. And those are in scarce supply, by the way. And, uh, and uh, in it, he makes an interesting point. One of the reasons Reagan was good at what he did was that he practiced for years. And he practiced in front of audiences. Uh, in the beginning, speaking on the lecture circuit for General Electric Corporation. And so he, he just got better and better because he saw how to deal with people and he could watch their responses. And, you Do know, you think it is true, Dr. Arn, that the president having been for a decade a very successful i mean probably one of the most successful television actors because he was acting in the apprentice of our era along with oprah winfrey along with rush limbaugh on the air there are there are very few people who hold and maintain audiences for a decade that now that he is learning the role that he needs to play he is getting better by the day at playing that role yeah he he, he uh, you know, I have characterizations of him from people I know who work for him. And, uh, yeah, he's very quick. He's, uh, he, he is, I've had several people tell me, and it's been some have said in the press, too, he's very good at details. He plays close attention to details when he's interested in a subject, when he thinks the subject is worthy of his attention. And so, 
uh, it was a feature of Churchill and of Lincoln that when you went in to tell him something, you might not get to tell it in the order you intended. (laughs) (laughs) It's like a Supreme Court argument. (laughs) But you would leave knowing that he had extracted from you what you wanted to say. And as alongside often calling it into question, but he didn't just talk over you. He he asked, and uh, if you were doing a really great job, he would. Uh, you know, there's a story that's a public story. I'll tell you. One of my students is the uh, is the regulatory czar, and uh, he gave a report to the president one time, and uh, the president said, uh, "So you're the regs guy, are you?" And uh, my student said, yes, sir, I am. And he said, is that an exciting life? And, and uh, Paul Ray is this boy's name. He said, young man's name is, uh, yes, sir, very. And he said, is it exciting like Tiger Woods? Some people think Trump wants to be Tiger Woods. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, he said, Paul said, better. And he said, better. And Paul said, yes, sir, we get to serve the freedom of the American people. And Trump apparently said back, yeah, we do live exciting lives, don't we? <laughs> oh, interesting. Now, now, tell me about the um, the need to uh, extract information, because I, I think this is central for everyone who's listening. How Churchill went about it, how did he find his experts, where did he get them from, how did he get information outside of, because this is the problem in D.C. In fact, let me answer a different way. You are highly regarded in conservative circles. And I tell people you're the most influential conservative they do not know is as influential as he is. How many members of the legislative and executive elite have reached out to you for your wisdom? Um, yeah, you know, I have, uh, I'm too busy to do anything but talk to my friends. And despite the way we act, you're one of them, Hugh. So it's the ones that I'm friendly with, and there's a lot of them. And I talk to them, and I, they ask me questions, and I mostly I send them stuff. You know, they want to know what about this, and I look it up. It's often stuff from history. Because um, what what bothers me about Washington is that it does not seem uh, to be easily penetrated by good ideas from the outside. It well, seems just like Fortress D.C. So Aristotle writes this: uh, practical judgment is the intellectual virtue that makes choices, and choices are hard to make. And The reason you make choices is to have actions. And the choices, uh, the, the deliberation, it's called, is about the circumstances and the ultimate goal. Now, when a bunch of people get together, our model today, it's, it's actually even the academic model, is people are supposed to come in with a bunch of uh, already prepared positions representing contradictory things so they can find the least common denominator. And that's not what happens at all. When you reason with people, the ultimate goal, you can't really be colleagues, remember that's a college word, colleagues with people, unless your ultimate goal is the same. You know, in this case, the freedom and justice of the American people. And then people walk in and everybody's got different bits of knowledge and they compare it And then what Aristotle says they find, although circumstances are shifting, is they find the truth. The truth, right? And and the truth exists in those circumstances and might be different tomorrow, but they've all got to be looking for it together. I will tell you, I came within an ace of asking the students back to Hillsdale College from spring break, and we we reached that decision after an eight-hour meeting, And then we're all emailing each other back and forth at 2 o'clock in the morning and 3 o'clock in the morning thinking, is this right? And we get back together the next morning and change our minds. And although I regret that, I think it was probably the right decision. It was surely the safer decision. I want to contrast that with you are also uh, hillsdale.edu slash U.S. history. On a dime, on a dime, the college has produced what – Parents across the country need a three-week serious course on U.S. history supported by the best teachers and materials. That young man, Kyle, is well-trained by me, I think. Uh, (laughs) Hillsdale.edu slash U.S. history. And 
on a dime, you're doing what you can. How yeah. did that emerge? Well, you know, we because we work together, because we have a common idea about what we're going to try to achieve. And so, you know, we we have a lot of online courses. We've never taught online courses to our students here on the campus until yesterday. On Monday, I taught my first big online course with 36 students, and it worked pretty well, and they're scattered all over the country. And the class ended with professions of love. So we figured out how to do that in a week. And, uh, and you know, and, and all over the campus, the faculty last week, they just worked night and day, all, all week. Some of them were frightened to death of it, you know, and others are pretty adept, right? And they taught, taught each other, and the IT people taught them. So the point was, we just, you know, and then, you know, there's just a lot of parts of the college, and we all work together. And so Kyle works in external affairs now, and uh, he's, in head of, he's the director of online courses, and there's somebody who runs the charter schools, and the and she, and she works in, uh, in, in academic and in, in the provost office. Well, those two guys, those two people, have been working side by side for a week, and we've got a full slate of online courses going out to our charter schools right now and to homeschoolers across the country. And Soon that will be in demand. You know, Virginia parents. schools closed for the rest of the year. That means a five-month break for children in elementary school, which is not good for their learning. Well, the thing that I personally have said that reached the, and this is one of the reasons why I harp on getting people involved, was I, I uh, you know, we're, Hillsdale College is a big old love fest right now. I mean, scattered across the country. So my class ended with our professing love to each other last, yesterday, last night. We were studying Churchill. And, and why is that? Well, I did this little video, and I said, it's a shameful thing to waste a single day. Now we've got to learn to work in a new way. We have to work with the same intensity that we work when we're together. And that means people are not then just passive, right? They get to live human lives and use their abilities. And so we're all fired up, right? And, uh, you know, uh, my, I always start my classes with questions. And uh, somehow that technology works pretty well. Everybody gets to talk. And, uh, and everybody can see everybody else. That's cool. But, um, but the, you know, I, I get them to write some questions, you know, like a third of the class every time has got to write a comment or a question on the readings for the day. Well, the first question is, how is Hillsdale College going to come back stronger than ever? And the second question is, when do we get to come back to campus? So the first 20 minutes of the class, I talked about those two things. Everybody's interested in those two things. Everybody of course they wants are. Everybody to do what they can to make those two things happen. That's now, how you get something running so that it's powerful. And remember, that is the magic of America. It's not scientific expertise at the top. The magic of America is that everyone is a citizen and everyone is a potential volunteer. Now, Dr. Ron, I want to close by asking you to spend the last six or seven minutes about Churchill and time frame. We are concentrated right now. In the early, George W. Bush, after 9-11, said, we are met in the middle hour of our grief as he gathered people at National Cathedral. Single best line of his presidency, comforting, but also aware of time. Middle hour of our grief is very different from the hour of victory over the virus, but Churchill never did not stop thinking about what was going on 5 and 10 and 20 years down the road. How did he, how did he run that double track, the urgency of war production, of troop deployments, of a second front, of meeting with Stalin, but also the Stalin character is marching on Europe as surely as we are marching on Berlin. So uh, there's a single episode I thought of to answer this question. One of my favorite things about Churchill, there are so many, by the way, is that in November of 1943, think what the, what's going on, right? Uh, from uh, At the end of 1941, America comes in. 1942 was almost all a disaster. It sort of changed. Churchill called it the hinge, hinge of fate in late 42. 43, we were winning. We were still months away from getting back on the continent. And in November of 43, out of nowhere, Churchill launched... Uh, a parliamentary, 
bill to abolish what was called a Defense Regulation 18B. And 18B permitted them to imprison, to detain and imprison anyone uh, suspected of being a German sympathizer. And the war was not won yet. D-Day was still months in advance. And everybody said, you know, they, they said, this is premature. And Churchill, if I can find it, said, I'll have to paraphrase it. He said, uh, I don't know. Here it is. Um, On no account should we lend any countenance to the totalitarian idea of the right of the executive to lock up its political opponents or unpopular people. The door should be kept open for the full restoration of the fundamental British rights of habeas corpus and trial by jury on charges known to the law. You see, he carried the day in Parliament by reminding Britain why they're fighting the war. And so one job of leadership today is to keep that in mind. We, we are not responsible only for people being safe. We're also responsible for them being free. And so we should keep up that talk as the object of this battle. And not just this year or next election, but a decade and a generation and a century further, we can't lose liberty. I mean, we can't surrender that. That's right. That's urgent. And, you know, the elements of liberty are well known. There are principles and institutions and then characters of people. And the principles are stated in the Declaration of Independence and the institutions are are described in the Constitution of the United States, now much impaired. And we have to get back to the work of restoring the operation, the proper operation of the Constitution of the United States after this is over. And, of course, that will be a fierce battle. This is a fierce political year. And so we have to keep all that in mind while we remember to do what we have to do to save lives from this virus. A last question, Dr. Arndt. There is one great strengthening of the Constitution underway, which is the reminder of people that it is governors who get things done because it is states that are co-equal sovereigns with the federal government. And President Trump has been emphatic, though often distorted by the media, in telling the governors to do their what they do, which is govern. Yeah, that's right. And that's, you know, we, the state variation is a good thing. Because, you know, we can all make a, um, you know, we, we're going to make a lot of mistakes in the middle of this thing, a lot. And then the question is, are we all going to make all the same mistakes? Or can we have variability in local action and individual people helping? And then we'll figure out what the right thing to do is. And... Uh, Churchill loved to say, we will not repeat the mistakes of the past. We will make new mistakes. <laughs> so, so, so that's the thing, right? You need to, you know, we're, sp- we're supposed to be able to run our government. And it is bureaucratized now, and it needs, that needs, it needs to be diminished. And yet it does need to do what it's doing, which is unite in a crisis for concerted action. That's what we did in the wars. That's what we're doing with this virus, and that's good. A last question, a personal question about both Lincoln and Churchill. Humor and celebration. You cannot drearily proceed through years, weeks, months. You cannot. You must have good humor. You must celebrate. How did they do that? (laughs) Well, they had wicked senses of humor, both of them. Uh, I'll I'll tell one from Lincoln and one from Churchill. Uh, McClellan was succeeded by Hooker, who went down in the wilderness and at Chancellorsville, had a chance to end the war and instead got his fanny beat. And, and uh, he sent a cable in the middle of all that to Lincoln, and Lincoln read it in front of the cabinet. He says, uh, he signs it off from my headquarters in the saddle. And Lincoln looks up and says, Hooker's got his headquarters where his hindquarters are supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> And then, you know, there are so many from Churchill. Um, uh, Here's a great one that he said to the French that got around. uh, And this is kind of grim and kind of ironic and funny, too. 
they said that Reno asked Churchill when he can see that Churchill's going to fight on whatever French does, the French do. And, you know, that's a very sad meeting. And Churchill had just refused to send the rest of the, of the British Air Force to France. And he said, uh, Reno said, how can you hope to fight them alone? And Churchill says, well, I haven't thought very much about that, but I expect that the plan will be to drown most of them on the way over and kill the rest on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you see, that's uh, human, right? But it's, it's ironic and it's, it's grim, but it's also funny. Yeah, that's it. And, uh, and that thing, you know, I mean, there's a, these are people of tremendous sympathy. And, you know, Churchill, would, uh, Churchill was a blubber baby. He cried all the time. And he, he cried every time he went and toured the bombing damage, right? And he was moved by that and by the bravery of the people. And he extolled the bravery of the people. And uh, that's what's, you know, the thing that you can tell, I'm, uh, I think that we're doing the right thing here. But I'm also frustrated by it because it's not the kind of battle where we can give people a part, and we need to find a way to do that. Remember, beat the bug bonds. I, I do believe we're spending $2 trillion, an astonishing amount of money, and a lot of us would buy what we used to call liberty bonds or war bonds. I, yeah. I just think about that. Dr. Larry Arnhildale.edu for this and every conversation we've had. We will meet again at an appointed time next week. Uh, I appreciate your extended time this week to get a message out early to people who are leading and really are a little overwhelmed. I'm I'm not sure that Lincoln and Churchill were much given to self doubt, were they? Um, well, of course, they uh, questioned and examined themselves all the time. But when the bell rang, they were always ready to go. That's what people need. Larry Arn, Hillsdale College. Thank you, doctor. Always a pleasure.